아, 쏘리 쏘리 쏘리. 오, 많이 늦었나? 제수, why are you so late? What time is it now? 아, 누가 오명에 넣습니까? 자, 늦었으니 어서 돌아가세. 다들 오셔, 오셔, 오셔. 와, 와, 와. 와. 자, 자, 각설하고. 자, 오늘 지각생에서 다시 한번 설명하겠소. 나는 이 투어를 설명하게 돼. 바로 이 목룡이 올시다. <웃음> 오늘 이 자리는 나그네들에게 아침의 나라를 잘 소개해준 그네들을 위해 특별히 전하께서 이 곡을 소개하라는 어명이 쓰셨소. The King invites you. 지금부터 펼쳐질 이곳은 환상적이고 때론 경이로운 아침의 나라 서울이오! 그리딩스 어벤처스 The memories of last year's Heidel Ball with you all are still vivid and now a year has passed and with summer Heidel Ball has returned. This year's Heido Ball is especially significant as it's held at the Chateau de Benac in France, which aspired Heido, making it even more special for our adventurers. I wanted to meet and thank you in person, but this year I can only greet you through this video. Though it's a little sad, all of us at the Black Desert Studio, including myself, are working hard on the updates. So we thank you for your anticipation and support. Now, let's dive right into the news that you're most curious about. Starting with the conclusion of The Land of the Morning Light, Soul. The Land of the Morning Light was envisioned as a side story for Black Desert as part of our new continent project. With everything being a fresh attempt, we were both excited and anxious, but after its release, the overwhelming love and support from you all gave the entire Black Desert studio a huge boost of confidence. Not just for those adventurers here today, but our international players too. We understand that the Land of the Morning Light, rooted in Korean folklore, may have felt a bit unfamiliar, yet your enjoyment and support mean the world to us, and we wanted to express our heartfelt thanks once again. To show our gratitude, we've poured our hearts into preparing the Land of the Morning Light Part 2. Following Donghae Province, this time we've beautifully crafted Hwanghae Province, home to the capital Seoul, aiming to wrap up the stories from Part 1 in a grand finale. So, as you adventure in Seoul, consider part two as the epic conclusion to the land of the morning light. Adventurers well versed in Korean history might be wondering why we named the capital Seoul instead of the more traditional Hanyang. Modern day Seoul has been the capital since the Picture era in the 6th century, making it a historic cornerstone of the Korean peninsula. Over the centuries, it has been known by various names like Hanyang, Namgyong, and Hansong. The term Seoul is the native Korean word for capital, which over time became a proper noun referring to the capital city. The word transcends eras, making it fitting for the capital in the land of the morning light. Look, 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 look. The building here is the largest Buga building. 경혜루라고 하오. 이 경혜루에는 슬픈 전설이 있다고 하지. 이 경혜루 연못 안에는 두 마리의 청동 용이 있다고 하지. 한 마리는 그 모습이 발견되었지만 나머지 한 마리는 아직 발견되지 않았다고 하오. 하지만 나는 그한 마리가 이 경혜루를 그리고 우리의 마음을 지켜주고 있다고 믿어 의심치 않아. 어, 레인다. 피치푸지 레인다. Of course. The most important thing is an unbreakable heart. In preparing for this soul chapter, our main focus was to authentically recreate our ancient capital, Gyeongbok Palace. With the Cultural Heritage Administration's help, we utilized drone footage, scanning, and LIDAR to capture Gyeongbok Palace in its entirety. For parts that haven't been reconstructed, we filmed Changdok Palace to fill in the gaps. 
We also aim to infuse historical authenticity by referencing the mountain ranges of Mount Bugak and Mount Sorak to shape the terrain. Through this meticulous process, we brought soul to life, cradled by Mount Ashi, by recreating parts of Gyeongbok Palace, Changdok Palace, and Yukjo Street in the game, adventurers from around the world will feel as if they are truly in Seoul. Personally, I feel it would be fantastic if history students visited the Gyeongbok Palace in the Land of the Morning Light instead of the real one. We've also brightened up Hwanghae Province compared to Donghae Province by adding more colorful vegetation. Also, places like Soryeongko, Udu School, and Jodo School, previously known only by name, have been faithfully recreated, making it enjoyable to explore with the new collection of tales. A new manor named Hyunrokdang will be introduced in this Seoul chapter. The previous manor in Donghae Province, Shimhyangje, was designed to blend with its surroundings. This time, the new manor is right within the capital. From the manor, you can see the stunning Gyeonghaeru, offering a breathtaking view that surpasses even the views of the Han River. We've also added many new pieces of furniture, so we hope you enjoy the manor to its fullest. Unbelievable. This chapter takes place in Seoul, the land of the morning light. After your adventures in Tonghe Province, your loyal companion Tosui will visit Palan Hosu to reunite with you. After catching up with your old friend, you'll receive an invitation from the newly promoted Tosui and head to the land of the morning light. There, you'll reunite with Ms. Myo, Mr. Turt, and the lovely Mihyun as you embark on your journey to Seoul. Remember how Tosui helped you register as a foreigner so you could explore freely throughout Tonghe Province? In Seoul, he'll make you a Hyanghwain, essentially naturalizing you as a citizen of the land of the morning light. Of course, the crafty Torsue wouldn't grant you citizenship for free. He has his own plans. While you enjoy the serene yet bustling atmosphere of Seoul and Gyeongbok Palace, you and Torsue will face a colossal, unbearably devastating crisis. To resolve this and bring Dawn back to the shadow land of the morning light, You'll venture through Hwanghae Province, just as you did in Tonghae Province. We've prepared rich stories in Seoul that are just as extensive as those in Tonghae Province. Once you complete the prologue, you can freely enjoy the collection of tales, presented in an omnibus format. This time, the collection of tales offers eight stories, the tale of Chunhyang, two sisters, Purgasar, a child in blue, Sodong, Uturi, Samshin, and Choyong. We hope our travelers are all excited for the many stories that await you. We promise to bring you captivating tales that won't disappoint. In the previous Donghae Province chapter, the collection of tales featured traditional folk tales. This time, the Hwanghae Province chapter includes more mysterious content and a bit of political drama. Since political dramas are a familiar genre even overseas, we believe that adventurers abroad will find the Seoul chapter easier to understand and more enjoyable. We also consider the enjoyment of gameplay in this Seoul chapter. While part 1 was designed with easy gameplay for new adventurers, the Seoul chapter includes more in-depth combat, offering a variety of gameplay experiences. One of the main characters in the collection of tales, Uturi, might be unfamiliar even to Korean players. However, through participating in martial arts competitions like the Martial God Tournament during gameplay, you'll naturally come to understand the character and become immersed in the story. Remember arriving in Nampo? There were cute little yellow dogs that warmly welcomed us to the region. It was a light interaction, but many of you really liked it. 
In the Soul chapter, we have expanded on such interactive elements. As you adventure through Huanghe province, you will naturally encounter people, animals, dokebi, ghosts, and objects that will try to talk to you or catch your attention. You can ignore them, but if you show interest, they will respond, sometimes humorously and sometimes trivially, adding small joys. We wanted to enhance the liveliness of the world and the feeling of adventuring through Huanghe province with these interactions. Also, you know our princess of the fallen kingdom, right? As you progress through the collection of tales, adventurers who love and play as Tamer will encounter meaningful content for her. We hope you look forward to it. Let's go! Okay. Okay. What for music is this? Our morning in Seoul music. What the hell? BTS, Bong Joon-ho, Song Mong-nim, Im Mong-nyong. Let's party! In part one of the Land of the Morning Light, folk music played a significant role alongside many folk tales. In Land of the Morning Light, Seoul. We have prepared the court music and classical music from the Joseon Dynasty, so you can immerse yourself in the authentic, historical atmosphere of Hanyang in game. We've collaborated with the National Kugak Center's orchestra to produce music of even higher quality, which is something you can look forward to. You can also hear the music of Choyongmu, which is a court dance, and the love song of Chunhyang and Dorsue in the game. To this end, we've cast Kim Soo Young for the role of Chunhyang who can perform Pansori. Commentator Chun Yong-jun has also participated as a special guest actor at a unique turning point in the land of the morning light. In the audio department, we are particularly focused on directing cutscene performances and audio mixing to effectively convey the unique atmosphere of classic materials. Our audio team is striving to create better sounds by applying our development experiences to the fullest. 자, 이 집현전에서 문제를 풀어보는 시간을 가져보겠습니다. 자, 문제 나갑니다. 이 우사가 사용한 기술 속 언어는 한글이다. 자, 정답은 올소. 야, 시작 테스트. 아, 좋습니다. 이곳은 더 다양하고 재미난 즐길거리들이 많습니다. 한번 알아볼까요? Up next, let's dive into the details of the Black Shrine bosses. Alongside Jianghua and Hongnyeon, Bulgasal and Dark Bonghuang, we have Uturi, Samshin, Jigui, Child in Blue, and Choyong. Plus, there are two mysterious hidden bosses yet to be revealed, making a total of 10 unique bosses you can encounter. While the part one lineup was incredibly intense and might overshadow these new additions in terms of recognition, our art team has reimagined Uturi, Jigui, and Child in Blue based on myths and legends, making them feel fresh, and exciting. Take Uturi for instance, inspired by the Korean folktale The Baby Generalissimo. Here, Uturi is depicted as a magpie, symbolizing wise and common folk, adding a layer of heroic symbolism. The soldiers aiding Uturi are designed as millet, red beans, and beans, enhancing the character's charm and staying true to the folktale. Each boss boasts a distinct combat style. Uturi wields a massive slingshot, continuously summoning its minions, red bean swordsmen, millet spearmen, and bean archers to keep up the assault. Uturi also locks onto the weakest adventurer with precise aim right at the start of the battle and focuses solely on this target until the fight is over. 
When Uturi unleashes a powerful attack, it is crucial to either share the damage with the targeted adventurer or retaliate to keep your strategy intact. Jigri, meaning fire ghost, lives up to its name with a blazing display of flames in combat. Each boss has its own unique flair and characteristics, so there's plenty to look forward to. As you might have noticed from the battle scenes, Black Shrine 2 is designed for cooperative play rather than solo adventures. Initially, we aimed to develop a guild raid involving 10 or 20 players, but to boost the sense of achievement via teamwork and strategy, we pivoted to a 5 player party boss. Black Shrine 2 brings some changes compared to the original. The most significant change is that you'll be using your own gear. We kept the difficulty level simple, offering just normal and difficult modes for you to choose from. Additionally, in Black Shrine 2, you cannot recover HP through conventional means. This includes potions or character skills that would normally recover HP. You can only regain HP through special recovery orbs summoned during the battle. When a party member dies, they can only be revived a limited number of times throughout the fight. The unique auras of the Black Shrine, Sun, Moon, and Earth will be utilized differently this time. Before the battle begins, adventurers will choose an aura, and this choice will determine their unique roles during the fight. The Sun Aura can inflict crowd control effects like knockdown to the boss in certain situations. The Moon Aura can increase the number of revives for the party. Lastly, the Earth Aura can summon a certain number of HV recovery orbs, greatly aiding the party's survivability. Adventurers can mix and match these three auras based on playstyle or the boss's characteristics before engaging in battle. Since these boss fights were designed with cooperation in mind, we aim to solidify each party member's role, emphasizing teamwork and sense of accomplishment. Some of you might worry about being a burden on the rest of your party, but the overall difficulty is designed to be easier than Ataraxion. As guild members will frequently engage in this content, we will prepare thoroughly to ensure it doesn't strain friendships. Also, note that the rewards can only be received once a week, just like the original Black Shrine. Although Black Shrine 2 isn't a guild raid, we hoped it would still serve as valuable guild content. Therefore, if all five party members are from the same guild, the guild will receive additional benefits upon beating the boss blitz. When a guild party successfully completes the boss blitz, the number of completions will accumulate, and based on this, additional rewards will be given to all members once a week. We also plan to support guild rankings based on boss blitz time. So we hope that this will strengthen the bonds among guild members. And when you're with guild members, even though you completed the boss blitz yesterday, other guild members may need help completing it today. We've added a feature to give likes to guild members who assist each other in boss battles. Guild members who receive many likes will be specially marked on the guild member list and if the accumulated number of likes exceeds a certain threshold, a special title will be awarded. Many adventurers expressed their disappointment that the previous Black Shrine wasn't a party type boss, and we hope Black Shrine 2 will fill that gap. Next up, we have Palace Management, which is a new life skill content coming with Land of the Morning Light Soul. Once you complete the main questline of Soul, you will unlock multiple production nodes within Gyeongbok Palace. Here, you will be able to acquire some unique materials. What sets Gyeongbok Palace's production nodes apart from others is that they have individual node levels. There will be various benefits to raising the level of a node, such as a greater chance of rare materials or a change in produced items. You can increase node levels through various means, such as completing quests from certain NPCs or delivering items. The items produced from these nodes have various uses. Some can be combined and sold in Balanos for a decent amount of silver, while others may serve as ingredients for crafting rare items. Since items produced from each node can change periodically, adventurers should invest strategically across all nodes to obtain the items they most need. 
One of the benefits of palace management is that it also offers automated processing and trade. Once adventurers have set up the initial processes for automated item production and processing trade goods, the only manual task remaining will be to sell the completed trade goods to vendors. As mentioned earlier, production items will change periodically, so as long as you check in occasionally to see the new items, this can serve as a fun and profitable way to earn extra silver. Next up, we'll be taking a look at the new items from the Land of the Morning Light Soul update. First up, this is something you've all long waited for, the new primordial tier weapons, the Sovereign. The Sovereign weapons are a completely new tier unlike existing Black Star weapons or Fallen God defense gear. What this means is that the Sovereign weapons will be the highest grade items in Black Desert going forward. Given how impressionable the Black Star weapons appear, we felt it only fair to devote a substantial amount of our efforts on their look as well, and applied a Dark Bonghuang motif complete with a visual effect on par with the theme. Only main and awakening weapons will be available at release. There are no current plans for a sub-weapon version, but this will be considered after the initial release. There will be three methods to craft these epic weapons. The first method involves combining a pen Black Star weapon with a new item from the Black Shrine, the Primordial Flame. This method of combining the pen Black Star weapon with a new item may be most familiar to veteran adventurers, yet acquiring the Primordial Flame will be challenging. The second method involves combining two pen Black Star weapons. Basically, two pen Black Stars become one sovereign. No additional materials are required. The final method involves combining a pen Black Star weapon with a boss weapon at Kafras level 20, along with another new item, the Gem of Twilight. The Gem of Twilight will also be obtainable from the main continent, but considering the value of the materials involved, this method would be the most expensive of them all. We put a lot of thought into the means of crafting the Sovereign. On one hand, we wanted to preserve the value of the painstakingly earned pen Black Star weapons. On the other, though these are to become the highest grade weapons, we didn't want to make them too difficult to obtain. Thus, we came to offer three crafting methods, which we hope will suit the different playstyles of all our adventurers. Next, we'll be going over the features of the Sovereign weapon. Unlike other weapons, the Sovereign will only have 10 enhancement levels. Originally, we planned to use the existing levels from 0 to 15, then on a pride of pen, but that felt a bit excessive. Therefore, since we're introducing the new primordial tier of weapons, we felt having only 10 enhancement levels would further add to its novelty. While Pen is currently the ultimate level of enhancement in Black Desert, we wanted the primordial tier weapons to surpass that. Thus, the Sovereign weapons will be enhanceable for 10 levels from Pride, Duo, Tri, all the way up to Oct, Nav, and Deck. We wanted to preserve the Roman numeral system used for naming the enhancement levels as before. The reason for this 10 level system wasn't solely to make the enhancement process hard. Getting through each enhancement level for Black Star weapons and the Fallen God defense gear felt quite burdensome for some. Thus, we wanted to reduce that daunting feeling between levels while still offering a more balanced and gradual growth experience. Regarding the difficulty, we kept the Fallen God defense gear in mind as, while the final levels will be extremely challenging, the overall enhancement process was designed to feel balanced. However, the Sovereign weapons will require exclusive materials, which will take quite some time to amass. While crafting the weapon itself can be done quickly through the three methods mentioned above, the enhancement process itself will not be skippable, especially for adventurers with sizable pockets. But we wished to offer an equal opportunity for all adventurers in their pursuit of greater strength. Also, to ensure your enhancement success isn't solely reliant on luck, failing to enhance the Sovereign weapon will utilize the 100% guaranteed enhancement system that has recently introduced, Ancient Anvil. Another feature of the Sovereign weapon is that adventurers can choose their desired effects. Besides attack power, you'll be able to choose up to 5 additional effects. Through a special refining process, adventurers will be able to choose the effects best suited to them. As you can see on the screen, various effects will be available, and you can apply five of them onto your weapon. To apply these effects, you will need separate refining materials, 
Some of the more core effects, such as extra damage, HP damage reduction, evasion, and accuracy, will be a bit easier to obtain and swap as you please. More unique effects will require special reform stones, which will be harder to acquire and thus add to their rarity. In summary, core effects are designed to be easily accessible for adventurers freely customizable to suit their respective playstyles, while unique effects will cater more to adventurers who wish to put more time and effort in collecting each rare trait to really stick out from their peers. Do note that these effects will continue to be added post-release. The final feature of the Sovereign weapons are their visual effects. Akin to Blackstar weapons, special visual effects are attached depending on their enhancement level. At Pen, a dim lighting effect will appear, and at Oct, a more intense visual effect will be noticeable. However, no matter how visually appealing a weapon might be, they are bound to grow stale over time. To keep things fresh, we've designed it so the Sovereign weapon's visual effects will be preserved even when wearing other weapon appearances. Even if you change appearances, the weapon's visual effect will remain. Of course, if you prefer the original look, you'll be able to toggle the effect as you please. So, Mongyong tour, 다들 어떠셨어? Mongyong, I can't wait for Seoul. Me too. I can't wait to play. 좋소. 이제 타고 왔던 마을 버스 아니 마그누스 타고 돌아가 볼 시간이요. 목적지 잘 설정하셨죠? 오케이. 그러면 살펴들 가시오. 안녕. 잘 가시게. 그럼 아침에 나라에서 만나고 안녕. 테스 너도 가야지. 아니 나 약속 있을 거야. 빨리 오늘 타. Next is a rather special update, introducing an exclusive server for existing adventurers, Hardcore Server Season One. The rules are simple. You create a Hardcore Server character to play on the server. You begin at level 60, and can only use the provided gear, which have a 20-30. 2080 gear score. These can be relatively easily enhanced up to around 260 to 300. You can use recovery potions, but foods and elixirs will not be available. You cannot see each other's family names, and both party and chat functions are disabled. Also, PvP is always activated, so you can attack anyone without restrictions. And what's more, once you die, it's over. That's the basic gist of it. Oh, and don't worry, your character isn't deleted. You're shipped away to a cell, where you will need rest points in order to escape. It will take a few days to get enough points. Or you can fight other inmates in 1v1 bouts to take points from them. We're planning to operate the Hardcore server in Seasons with a special ranking system. The longer you survive or the fewer times you die than others, the higher you rank. And once the season is over, we want to give special rewards for your rank. Character effects like Stormtrooper that last until the next season, or exclusive titles with new colors. This Hardcore server is for those tired of constant gear upgrades to allow you to focus solely on gameplay without worrying about gear. We will provide more details when we update the content. Next is on Dekia's Lantern Tier 2 and new accessories. Alongside the Land of the Morning Light Soul update, Tier 2 difficulty will be added to Dekia Monster Zones. Since its initial development, Dekia's Lantern was designed to allow adventurers to choose their own difficulty setting it apart from Elvia. With the upcoming patch, you will be able to activate Dekia Tier 2. Also, Dekia's Lantern will be available in more monster zones. These zones are Kadri Ruins, Crescent Shrine, Gaifen Rajia Temple, and Miramok Ruins. While the difficulty of Tier 2 will be maintained at the level you're used to, Tier 2 will require you to have a combined AP and DP of at least 750, making it challenging for even our top tier adventurers. Starting with Tier 2 of Dekia's Lantern and beyond, there will be special weekly quests so you don't have to spend too much time fighting monsters. 
Completing these quests yields substantial rewards. This is to ensure high efficiency for everyone who can at least complete these quests. New accessories universally available in both the Black Shrine and existing monster zones are being introduced, called it the Asadar set. Asadar accessories are of the same grade as Tungrad accessories, allowing for special abilities when worn, akin to Tebex belt. We hope this adds meaning for those who wish to craft their own playstyle. Guilds are a very important element of Black Desert. They help adventurers grow from rookies to veterans, and they serve as a fundamental community tool that allows adventurers to bond with one another while working together toward a common goal. Additionally, there are many guild benefits, which is why many adventurers advise the first thing to do in Black Desert is to join a guild. However, as time passes and more content gets added, running a guild becomes challenging, and the feelings of bonding while achieving goals together have become less exciting of late. We have determined that changes are needed in this area. In that sense, we plan to add a few new systems. First of all, we're adding a guild's representative trait system and tiers. Each guild has its own playstyle they pursue. Even just by looking at the descriptions, node conquest war oriented, casual, life, and so on. Unfortunately, these guild traits had to be communicated only through guild introductions and it's difficult for other adventurers to intuitively know them. Now with the addition of the new system, all guilds will be able to select their desired trait. These traits are categorized into three types, PvP, PvE, and life skills. If your guild likes PvP, you can select the PvP trait, and if you prefer PvE, select PvE. Once a trait is selected, related fame can be accumulated. To explain this more clearly, I will use the PvP trait and fame as examples. Guilds with the PvP trait will accumulate PvP fame based on the results of Node Wars, Conquest Wards, Guild League, Red Battlefield, War of the Roses, and Arena of Solare. And based on this fame, the guild's PvP tier will be determined. This tier is not based on accumulated fame, but rather determined by the ratio among all guilds that have selected the PvP trait. While frequent participation is important, guilds with high skill and teamwork will form the top tier, enhancing their fame in the Black Desert world. The accumulated tier will affect not only the overall benefits for the guild and its members, but also affect various systems. One example is its use as MMR for Node and Conquest Wars. Now, guilds with high PvP tiers can only participate in node wars of certain tiers and cannot participate in lower tiers. The strong will compete with other strong guilds and the same for weaker guilds. This creates a clear hierarchy promoting growth through promotion and regulation, systematizing the growth of all guilds. As such, we aim to provide honor rewards based on tiers. High tier guilds will have exclusive seals engraved on their guild and family names, and when they chat on the server or world, there will be visual effects to make them appear more dignified. Also at last year's Calfian Ball, we revealed the Dragon Guild Mount. Achieving the top PvP or tier will grant the right to mount the Black Dragon, as shown on the screen. The tier system based on guild traits and fame is not intended to incite vague competition. As explained earlier, we hope that all guild members will advance toward their goals together and that new adventurers will enjoy related content together, allowing them to adapt more quickly to our world of Black Desert. Today, I only explained the PvP trait and tier, but I will also explain the PvE and life aspects before the update, so please look forward to it. Oh, and speaking of which, we recently adjusted skill hit counts, and we are also working on additional optimizations. This involves changing the internal structure without affecting gameplay. Once completed, it will certainly improve things, so we're gunning to complete this task. Along with this work, we also plan to resume the War of the Roses. We hope you'll look forward to that as well. Next up, we have summer events and an exclusive outfit. We introduced the Sea Palace along with Teramian last year. 
Sadly, we weren't able to prepare a new event area for this year, but we still wanted to bring you something new. As you know, the Termian region has Papus and Otters, and the Sea Palace has Earfolk and Shellfolk, so this time you'll be able to visit both regions, and all four races will be brought together through various summer events. Earfolk and Shellfolk will take trips to Termian and run in racing competitions against Papus and Otter, where they might compete at Sand Castle Crasher, engaging in fierce competition to see who's superior. We've prepared many events and we hope you look forward to them. Next, we have this summer's new outfit. The name of this outfit is Badaka. The art team have prepared more than usual for this one. While the outfit has one main design, we added some variations for an extra layer of customization. Although we can dye outfits, sometimes we just want more options. We hope you enjoy this variety and style. Some ideas were borrowed from our merchandise, such as the Papu logo, which give it a distinct black desert touch. This outfit also has a cape on-off feature. Our male characters went shirtless in too many of our summer outfits, so we tried to make their outfit a bit less revealing this time. For the female characters, they will be wearing a shirt on top of a bikini, which also have a cape on-off feature. Adventurers have been awaiting a refreshing bikini look for the summer, and this outfit definitely answers those calls. Additionally, through the Pearl Shop, you'll be able to purchase dances and other accessories such as sunglasses and hats, which will be perfect for the summer. As Black Desert celebrates its 10th anniversary, we've prepared an extra special summer event and outfit. We hope you enjoy it and have fun. That's all we have prepared for you today. In addition to the things mentioned today, we are still diligently working on the quality of life improvements, both small and large updates, including things mentioned at last year's Calpheon Ball. We are doing our best to bring these things to our adventurers, so we really hope that you will enjoy our Land of the Morning Light Soul content that we are working so hard on. Thank you. <laughs>